Um, thanks everybody for joining in. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn. I run the services at MedComsNetworking.com. So uh, what I try and do there is, is encourage, facilitate, um, catalyze discussion, um, uh, encourage you all to talk to each other across the global MedComs community. So medical communications, medical education, medical publishing, and so on. And these webinars are a great opportunity to get indeed hundreds of people together from around the world um, and importantly to get specialists online to talk about different topics. Uh, today we're talking about listening to the patient voice. Um, I'm particularly pleased that we're finishing here with the uh, the publishers. Um, this is a bit of a repeat. We, we annually get together um, this group, Meet the Publishers, I call it, um, and um, uh, and it's a great opportunity just to hear what's going on at the journals. But today we are going to focus very much on involving the patient voice in journal advertising. Um, before uh, we do anything else, I'd like everyone to introduce themselves. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm not quite sure what the order is. I'm going to go around. Um, so stay on your toes, everybody. Mitty, tell us who you are, who you represent, and just give us a, a headline or two of what's happening at your company. Mitty, off, if you, you take the lead. Peter. Hi everyone, my name is Mitty Ahmed Richards. I am the executive editor for current medical research and opinion at Taylor and Francis and I'm also their internal patient champion working with different patient groups and patient collaboration initiatives. I'm also a patient advocate for scleroderma in Reynolds UK um, and recently I worked and published the very recent um, patient authorship guidance landing page that Taylor and Francis has produced. Um, and that's been quite a big initiative for us and, and something that we're feeling quite passionate about. OK, fantastic. And it's great to have you online. Um, I think this is your first time on the Meet the Publishers panel, isn't it? So thank you very much. Um, Laura, I'm going to go to you next. Tell us who you are. Hi, everybody. I'm Laura Dormer. I'm editorial director at Bacaris Publishing Limited. I'm also the editor of our journal, The Journal of Comparative Effectiveness Research, which is a journal that looks at health economics and real world evidence studies and things like that. Um, I've been um, working, uh, I guess, specifically within the area of plain language summaries, as, as far as this, this uh, webinar goes, um, for a, a few years now. I work with my colleague, Joanne Walker, on developing plain language summary of publication articles um, and just a, a very keen advocate for plain language summaries um, and coming up with with us, I guess, in Bacaris next year, we are going to be for the first time mandating abstract plain language summaries in our in our journal. So um, we've encouraged and uh, tried to shove them along uh, for the last few years, and we're finally uh, taking the final step of mandating. So that'll that'll be fun. <laughs> okay, excellent. And Bacaris is still um, uh, the the new the new kid on the block, as far as this is concerned, isn't it? Yeah, so we, have, is... we have the one journal, so it's and the one we have journal. A yeah, website yeah. called the Evidence Space. So those are our two, our two. Excellent. But how old are you now? It's three, four, uh, uh, four or five years. We started in September twenty twenty two, so just over two, two years. Two. Yeah, Excellent. Oh, it's to you. Okay, right. Okay, even newer than I thought you were. Okay. Well, thanks so much for joining in again, Claire. Can I ask you to tell us who you are and and um, what's happening at your company? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Claire Cook. I'm the editorial manager at the ADIS Journals, which are part of Spring and Nature. I've uh, been with the company almost 16 years, uh, and we're a portfolio of over 30 journals, publishing in all therapeutic areas of clinical medicine, uh, all offering kind of rapid or timely publication, open access options, and a personal responsive service for authors uh, to try and assist them through the publication process as easily as possible. Um, we've got a popular pre-submission inquiry service, uh, which helps authors make an informed decision about where best to submit the research and give it the best chance of getting through peer review. Um, in terms of what we've going on, we've got a range of things beyond the kind of traditional manuscript. But some of the most relevant things uh, are our patient and physician perspective articles, which is a commentary kind of co-authored by a patient or carer talking about um, the kind of key aspects of their condition alongside a physician underpinning that with their experience and clinical data. We've got podcast and vodcast articles, which are increasingly popular, standalone podcast articles, which have their own DOI, they're citable, they're on all the kind of key streaming sites, um, and can also bring in patient speakers and authors into that. And then our summary of research articles as well, which are our standalone summaries of a pre previously published article, uh, avoiding kind of specialist and technical jargon. So aimed, aimed primarily at healthcare professionals, either non-specialist or time poor clinicians, but also potentially of interest to a wider audience, including patients as well. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so Hamish, you've been on every one of these um, annual meetings now, I think. Well done for sticking the um, the course with me. Um, tell us who you are and, and where you are and what's happening at, um, at Sage. 
Yeah, thanks, Peter. Uh, so my name's Hamish McTeagle. Um, I'm the Publishing Solutions Manager at Sage, where I've been for nearly seven years now, uh, though I've been in scientific communications for about 13 years in total. Um, so Sage publishes about a thousand journals, though specifically in the clinical medicine space, we have about 300 titles. Uh, we're a highly mobile and flexible publisher, so we're continually adding new publishing solutions to our portfolio. Um, we offer a full range of publication extenders across our journals. Uh, we also offer plain language summaries, both within manuscripts and the full article plain language summaries of publication. And in the last year, we've also launched uh, podcast articles at Sage as well. Um, we do have a microsite aimed at promoting plain language research. Uh, we also have a patient editorial board on more of our on our patient centric titles, um, and we also work with patient reviewers for plain language summaries. Uh, we also do have a journal focused on patient experience, and we also publish patient perspectives across many of our journals. Excellent. Thank you so much, guys. OK, right. We're now going to have a freewheeling, unscripted discussion and see where we end up. Um, to people watching this, it is worth looking back over the previous years. I think it's fascinating to... Um, well, I, I am sadly one of those people that goes back and looks at those videos a little bit and thinks about things. Things have changed a lot over the last few years, and patient involvement is a topic that's become more and more sort of, you know, um, important in what we're talking about. Um, but it does feel like a long time ago we started talking about um, plain language summaries and, and the, the role of the patient in that, which we'll come back to, OK? Um, I, I want to take it, I've got, I've, I've written effectively four stages down to this conversation. Let's see where this goes, OK? Um, but it seems to me we could have a useful conversation around patient involvement at an editorial type level, editorial board type level, at an approval type level, peer review type level, um, at an authorship type level, and at a readership level. So if you're all happy, I'm going to go in that order. Hamish, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to be jumping around. So everyone, you know, I'm going to keep you all on your toes. Um, Hamish, I'm going to start with you. Let's, and as I say, let's talk about that editorial board level. What, what happens at Sage? What's involved uh, in, in, what involvement do you have in patients at that level in any of your journals if they're involved? Absolutely. So we have a couple of journals which have a lot of patient engagement, uh, particularly our therapeutic advances in drug safety and therapeutic advances in rare disease. Um, and our patient editorial board really do help with a number of things, uh, particularly guidance around, you know, their own involvement and, and things like that as well. Um, something that they have come up with, you know, in the last couple of years as well is mandating um, plain language summaries for every single manuscript, uh, which has been great. And we haven't actually seen any drop off in submissions. I think, you know, when we initially started to consider that as a decision, there was a concern that that might be uh, something, but actually it's it's been sort of highly beneficial and the quality of plain language summaries has been pretty strong across the board as well. Just to clarify, can I just, and I, um, to pin you down slightly, but I think you said you've got patients involved in the editorial board level in a couple of journals, yes. but you've got hundreds of journals. So what's the sense within the company in terms of whether that's working, whether you'll get them involved with more journals? What are the barriers to them getting involved in more journals? I think it makes sense for us to do on journals where we see a lot of patient engagement, uh, where they can sort of add value. I don't think it's something where we would say, OK, let's do this en masse across all titles. We do have a patient advisory board as well who can sort of help guide decisions across the company for Sage. Uh, and I think that works well, but I don't think it necessarily makes sense to do it for every single journal. Um, as I mentioned, where we see a lot of patient engagement, those are the kind of places that we would look to have a patient editorial board. OK, so you're picking and choosing, which makes some sense. OK, um, I'm going to bounce around. And, and guys, um, you know, I don't want this just to be, you know, asking each of you the same question and getting the same response back. OK, so but if I if I if I start to jump over you and you've got a point to make, do jump in and, and join in. Um, but following this line of thought, Mitty, I'm going to bring you in. And I'm sort of slightly in. Well, A, the question is, have you got patients on the editorial boards of your journals? Let's start with that question. In fairness, I'll come on to a second question. So we don't have patients on editorial boards at the moment. It's something that we are definitely exploring. Um, but because we're kind of rolling out patient reviewers and patient authors across quite a wide range of our medicine and health journals, our focus has been primarily on that. Um, and that's kind of the next step now to kind of look into editorial board members. But what we do have uh, is similar to what um, Hamish just mentioned with patient advisory board. And they kind of advise us of the, of the overall strategic kind of okay. approaches that we take towards patient collaboration. OK, so put you on the put you on the spot then. You're a patient advocate and, and with your background and so on. I mean, how 
can I put it like this? How frustrated are you that patients aren't on any of the editorial boards at the moment? Is that something that you think is or, is or isn't important as maybe at least in time, time, time goes on? I think it is really important. And I think it's definitely something that has to be in the works, but I'm not too frustrated because I do think there's a lot of considerations in adding an editorial board member that is a patient. They're not a researcher. They're not, they're not somebody who's coming from a background of academia. So we want to make sure that we have to get just as much benefit as they do on the editorial board and that does require you know various processes and various steps so I feel although that's something that we need to prioritize I wouldn't want to rush it and I'd want to make sure that the, the journal can definitely cooperate and you know work really well with patients and um, if they have them on the board and they're not just there for the sake of being there so that we can tick a box. Exactly okay exactly I guess that's what I was sort of wondering. so Laura I'm going to ask you you've got one as you said one one journal it's a very specialist journal what what if anything is the role of patients on your editorial board? Yeah I'm at the other end of the spectrum just with, with the one title um, but at the moment um, as as Mitty said with, with their journals we don't have any uh, patient members on our editorial board um, as I said it's it's a health economics journal so it's it's a, a niche um, it's something that I have thought about and am actively thinking about but I think just to echo Mitty it's thinking about what exactly is that role what benefit would the journal get from it and what benefit would the patients get because the last thing I want to do is you know do it as a tick box exercise and I also don't want to waste people's um time you know we we, we don't want to be uh, well anybody's time really but patients as well okay. um but yeah it, it, it's so at the moment no but it is a it's a sort of a rumbling in the background sort of thought process of how that exactly works and, and again we've been sort of thinking more at the reviewer and the author level um and okay. I'm, you know these things uh, progress over time but yeah okay I mean, let's just let's okay. just finish this uh, with the editorial board level and and claire you're in a you're, you're in a very different sort of company i mean i know you're your your basic responsibility, as I understand it, is ADIS, but I mean, part of Springer, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lot of stuff going on there. So again, just give us a sense from your point of view of how, of how a patient might get involved or do they or don't they get involved at the moment in your journals? Yeah, I mean, on the editorial board side, we're somewhere in between what, yeah. what the other panellists have mentioned. So we have a couple of experienced patient advocates on our board. So Trisha is one of them. Um, so we have asked uh, those patient advocates to review a couple of our summary articles, our, our summary of research articles. But we are also exploring that a bit further to see, you know, what which articles should we be asking patients or patient advocates to be reviewing? How is that going to work? You know, day to day, will they always be on the boards? Will we have a pool of reviewers? So so that's kind of exploratory of where we're at at the moment. And then do you want me to go into the kind of authorship? Or are we sticking with editorial? No, no, take, now, take it right? one step at a time, guys, <laughs> one step at a time. Okay. And, and I would just like to give a shout out to the audience. We've got quite a lot of you online still. So um, if anybody out there, you know, can contribute to this conversation and maybe you've got your own experiences um maybe you are a patient that's that's involved with publishing or maybe you're in uh, uh, representing another journal or whatever uh, do share the information in the chat and the um, and the q and a's and so on and we can maybe bring that in um so what i was gonna what i was gonna so okay okay actually probably we should just let's move on from editorial board we've got a clear idea of that but i guess my sense is we're heading in an inevitable direction and we might pick and choose but there are many more journals presumably that are being set up with much more of a thinking we've got to involve everybody because that's the whole direction everything's going in sort of thing we've, and we have to involve the patient in care and all this the journals will reflect that therefore the the patient editorial boards are making sense there. I, I sound like I'm burbling a little bit, but there's a direction of travel, which I think is interesting, but we're at a very early stage, really, from what you're saying at the moment. So, okay, Claire, I don't want to jump to authors. I'd like to stick with the reviewers just for the moment. Um, and as I'm taking it in, in my little, set, you know, four steps, reviewers, where are you at with patient reviewers, which I know a lot of people are now using. And my key question, I guess, really is, how do you find them? So, but again, from all of you, let's get a sense of what, what they're doing and how you find them. So I think that's where we are at the exploratory phase at the moment, because as I said, we've got these couple, maybe three across the journals of patient advocates on our boards who have reviewed for us. So far, we've only asked them to review our summary articles. We're not asking them to review the kind of um, standard original research, even if they've got patient involvement. I mean, some of the podcasts we publish have patient speakers. Um, we haven't gone as far as making it standard to ask patient advocates or patients to review those yet, but that is what we're exploring. 
you know, should they be reviewed as standard? And I feel like that is probably the direction a lot of, you know, journals and companies are going in, as you've said. Um, but yeah, it's fine. It's finding the reviewers because you have very experienced patient advocate reviewers who are used to looking at this kind of content. So you also want to get the less experienced patients to look at this kind of thing because they are the ones who aren't used to this and who might be coming across this content and, and wanting to find it useful. So it's building up those pools and that's where we're at the very early phase of, um, I don't know if anyone else has more experience on how you find those those people or how best to find them or even which kind of people you're looking for. I think there's a lot of questions around those those areas. Exactly, exactly. Hamish, it looked like you were nodding away there. Have you? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on this particular point? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we use patient reviewers um, across our plain language summaries um, and, you know, so in, in some other publications as well. Um, in terms of, you know, how we would find them, I think there are some very well-known uh, patient advocates out there in the publication space that we're all aware of, probably, who are assisting all of us uh, across all of our different journals. Um, but also beyond that, it's just about talking to them and asking them for recommendations, um, using their networks. Also, Care Wells also very tapped into patient networks as well. Um, so, you know, particularly in certain spaces where there's a lot of patient engagement, um, you know, they'll be very aware of the most active patient advocates. And, you know, we've been able to build quite a big network ourselves just, you know, through those conversations. And um, anybody else? Got, what? what um, and maybe again, I don't know, am I being provocative or not? Um, are we breeding? Is there a danger we breed um, a group of patient experts who get involved in this sort of activity who become unrepresentative of the patients that they're supposed to be representing i i worry about that and uh, for me that's a thread that runs through a lot of this but you know do you naturally go to people to review papers who are high profile and essentially are just becoming the name in that area and have they frankly just become disconnected with their community mitty just try and pick that up and, and just give me a view on that I definitely think there is that risk of always going back to the same people um, and we absolutely appreciate having those experts because we need them. They help give us, like I say, strategic direction. They always point out things that we might not notice and they can challenge the status quo. But I think it is really important to also have that patient who doesn't have a lot of contact with the industry, maybe none at all. Um, so within our uh, TNF kind of um, business, we've got a dedicated team who work on finding peer reviewers and who, who are patients. And they also reach out to patients who are not from that expert background. And it's usually through like the internet, word of mouth, patient organizations. Sometimes we, we meet them through conferences, but chances are they are experts in the field if they're kind of attending conferences. But a lot of the time we, we're quite lucky with things like Twitter or X, depending on who you ask, um, and finding patients that are keen to learn about their disease or keen to be part of the, the disease landscape, but aren't necessarily involved within the industry itself and contributing the way, the way some of the higher patient experts are. But it is really important um, because I think the more you become an advanced patient advocate, for example, myself, you almost know more than the clinicians. You almost know more than the average researcher because you're researching your disease so much. Um, and sometimes it's refreshing and important to also have that person who can bring in that kind of newly diagnosed um, perspective as well. Just pursuing that, Mitty, and, and with that patient advocate hat on. And again, a, a question that I often ask is, you know, do you get the kickback from from the academics and the clinicians and the people who just think, well, this isn't something that patients should get involved in. It's my paper. I, I know what I'm talking about. They don't know what they're talking about sort of thing. You, you see what I mean? I haven't. I mean, on my side of things, I work with kind of my journal sees about 50 percent academia, 50 percent um, industry. And I haven't had any kickback. Our editorial board are kind of primarily made up of researchers and clinicians and academics. And they're really happy to see um, that we're kind of driving towards patient collaboration and patient initiatives. So from my side of things, I haven't seen any pushback, but I'm sure perhaps in other journals or in perhaps other areas that there might be. Is that, Laura, I'm going to come to you in a second because I've got a specific question I'm going to land you with. But, but Hamish, or well, Hamish, have you got anything on that front in terms of the kickback? Are you seeing it all positive? I, I honestly haven't encountered it myself. Um, you know, I think we've all heard about it and we're all aware of it. But, um, you know, specifically when we're, I think, I don't think it's as common as it would have been sort of five years ago. And I think, you know, generally... The field is definitely moving in the right direction on that front. So it's quite refreshing to see how openly, uh, how openly people are em embracing this sort of uh, move towards sort of patient-focused publications. Okay. Okay. Claire, um, 
can I ask the, the 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 obvious question in terms of remuneration again, sort of thing? And I know the BMJ has recently had quite a lot of publicity in the last week or so about the fact that they are now paying patient reviewers, as I understand it. So, can I just get a comment starting with Claire in terms of what the position is in terms of paying patient reviewers? I'm talking about I'm specifically, and I'm being careful what I'm saying it. I'm talking and wanting to talk about patient reviewers of the papers. Yeah. So your your responsibility to pay or not to pay. Yeah, we are exploring this at the moment. So it's early, early stages for us because we've only got these sort of couple of patient advocates on our board at the moment. We haven't yet been paying for their reviews. We have sort of an agreement that they're on the board and they help us and we offer them what we offer any of our editorial board members at the moment, which is um, a chance to have free publications because we charge you know, a fee for a rapid service and things. But obviously, I appreciate that is not relevant to all patients, which is what we're currently exploring. You know, that's that's not a compensation for a patient who doesn't author articles. So so we're exploring it at the moment. Um, and yeah, I've seen seen everything with BMJ and I know some of the other publishers on here are already paying their reviewers. So may have more to, to add to that. But yes exploratory phase for us okay let's stick with this paying patient reviewers um laura i know i've got you on tender hooks now but i'm assuming because you won't have patient reviewers particularly with your particular well, journal or do you we do yes so the journal on, does, does publish the the plain language summary of publication articles so oh, i see okay and they review the those, pls yes the plsp so okay. we always have those reviewed by patient reviewers um and we do and always have reimbursed them for the time they spend oh, okay now that's an important point okay having said that i want to shove pls down the the list just a little bit um mitty hamish have you got anything to add to talk to the the the, the issue of paying patient reviewers for articles yes yeah, so I mean, we we um sorry, sorry mitty, go. Mitch, you want to go first <laughs> No, no, Missy, go first, go on. Um, yeah, so we pay um, patient reviewers for PLSPs, as Laura's mentioned, and we also would pay at least one patient reviewer for patient perspectives or any original research articles that include patient reported outcomes that require um, kind of like a patient review of those manuscripts. Um, so yeah, we, we give them kind of a fair, fair value. Okay, and Hamish, would you just nod away with that and say the same thing? Yeah, absolutely. And just to add on to that as well, I think something that isn't really being discussed amongst publishers is is the rates that we're all paying patient reviewers, because I know looking at what BMJ is saying, they pay, it's different to what we pay. And I think, you know, we all need to have a conversation about what is a fair market rate, because in my, in my opinion, what they were saying was, was the rate for paying a reviewer. I didn't think it was particularly high um, compared to, you know, what advice we've been given by patient advocates and, and what, you know, what is sort of considered fair use. Um, so I think it's important that we do all come together as publishers to kind of agree what that amount is. OK, I, I must admit, it's interesting you say that because I thought um, I thought that exactly when I saw I, I, I was intrigued that the BMJ was getting as much. Um, uh, what's the word? Um, news space about it, because, you know, very much they were being lauded as as um, as leading the way, whereas I didn't think they were quite at that position but also the amount of money they're paying isn't huge um so there's a discussion to be had in there and we can't have that today but i would obviously uh, encourage any other publishers watching this maybe you can all have a chat together um and 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 sort something out um but um i want to come on to authorship um and uh and let's just go straight to the um the question in terms of paying for authorship which is a a, a, an excite an area of some excitement and laura the reason I'm, I'm i've been setting you up here right okay um i know that as publishers you're going to say well it's not our responsibility to pay the authors however and we may get some comment in a moment from everybody but laura i'd like to set you up and you sort of knew i was going to because you are involved in gpp um and can you just say a few words about the GPP type guidance in terms of involving patients, the comment that they make, which is very vague in the in the document about paying them. And can you just fill us in on what's happening with GPP? Because GPP 2022 now feels like you know old hat. You know, I don't honestly know what the current plan is for GPP. And I don't know how much you know. So I'm just going to put you completely on the spot and ask you to say a few words on that, all of that. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, you, you did warn me in advance, so it's, it's, this is not a shock, people. Um, so, yeah, so for those of you that don't know, I was one of the authors on the most recent iteration of uh, GPP, which was published in August, I think, of 2022. So that was the fourth iteration of the GPP guidelines. Um, and sorry, I'm going to cut through. Good publication practice. Yeah, good publication we should, we should give people a bit more information to GPP. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. research. 
Um, so these are guidelines, as I say, that have been around for quite a while. Um, I think I'm right in saying, though, that the 2022 most recent iteration um, has been the first to, to really sort of pull in the, the patient Dimension patient at all, as far as I know, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think when we when we were obviously this is one of the key things that we discussed. I mean, we started talking about 2022 with the steering committee was pulled together in 2019. Um, so just to give you an idea of how long it takes from when the steering committee starts discussing a GPP to when it eventually came out was quite a, a long period. And a lot of our discussions obviously were around um, interweaving patient involvement into that. And what we, I think, didn't want to have was a, a section on patients. What we wanted was to weave it into all the various relevant sections um, of, of the GPP guidelines. So, for example, it's mentioned patient involvement is mentioned within the formation of publication steering committees. It's mentioned within um uh, uh reimbursement uh side of things you know trying to put it in wherever it's relevant we tried to put it in and something i was really pleased about with gpp 2022 was that this there was just one particular line that i really loved which was um that patients should be patients and patient advocates should be regarded as experts and i think that's really really important um that, that that's you know that they're given the, the equal footing with an hcp with the researchers everybody else um and you know considered their involvement considered in that same light um so that was that so then the reimbursement uh piece uh has been an interesting one and it's been one of the areas that has been perhaps not the most discussion post-publication but certainly a uh, high up the list of things that have been discussed since uh publication um and i guess something else to be aware of is that since the publication uh the gpp steering committee as it's known has gone on uh so we didn't just sort of stop when the publication came out. So uh, the authors that were involved in that um, have been still sort of answering questions, speaking at conferences, sort of giving the background on the on the guidelines and also um, are responsible for on the ISMAP website. Um, so ISMAP are responsible for coordinating uh, the GPP guidelines. Uh, we have an FAQ page and on there we have been responding to various different uh, points that have come up since publication. Artificial intelligence has been one, obviously. Um, uh, various different things, um, patient reimbursement being one of them, or author reimbursement being one of them. And I think where there's been some discussion is in, in the earlier iterations of GPP-2, GPP-3, the emphasis was very much on really underlining the ethical principles of authorship and making it very, very clear that paying somebody to put their name to a paper or paying someone above the odds to endorse a paper as an author was not on unethical so that issue of paying for ghost authorship um was absolutely no go and i think you know the wording was very strong on that um but i think subsequently to that and because of the increased involvement of different um uh, stakeholders in in authorship patients and patient advocates being one of them it's almost it was almost used as a kind of a barrier to being able to reimburse people like patients for their time that they take on on publication steering committees or whatever it might be so when the wording of GPP 2022 was uh, put together, the aim was to to try and make that clear. So to make it that it wasn't a barrier, the fact that somebody has been uh, paid for their time that they've involved. So if that's a patient um, been involved in the publication, that isn't a barrier to reimbursing. What GPP doesn't say is that you must or you must not pay patient authors, because that is a matter that is up to the individual um, organisations' uh, internal policies to decide what they want to do, what you know, what they want to do with any of their authors or any of the people involved. Uh, GPP isn't a, isn't a law, it isn't a regulation. It's it's a guidance so, document to try and guide best practice and ethical practice within the industry. But a lot of people do refer to it as as a strong guidance, um, and the wording is extremely. Um, open to interpretation isn't it um and there are companies who I, I know are saying you know all authors are treated the same i mean you've said we wanted patients to be treated the same, but if they're all being treated the same we don't pay any of our authors and others who say well the patients are a special group that seems to me a rather gray area and and, and, and as i say uh, um there's a spectrum of of, um, of activity there but just to cover it off and to put you on the spot um as of the moment in december 2024 What's the status of the next iteration of GPP? Is there a is there so a at status? the moment? So as I, I actually I should have mentioned as well. So this this GPP steering committee, as I say, is still active. We're still answering FAQs, and I would I would advise people to go onto the FAQ yeah. page. I'll pop I'll pop the link in the chat. Um, but the, the very first bit is quite a large chunk of text, all about author reimbursement. So I would strongly advise you have a look okay. at that. Thank you. Um, but also, what's been going on is that we have not just stuck with the author group 
in that steering committee as it stood on the publication. We've recently been inviting uh, others to become involved in that steering committee. So, for example, um, patient representative uh, now on that steering committee, um, somebody representing HUR and real world evidence, which is another area I think that could do with um, perhaps further elaboration in future iterations. At the moment, there isn't a date or a plan to uh, okay. begin the next iteration and also I would say that the people that are on the current GPP steering committee aren't necessarily going to be the authors on that next iteration that's not been agreed at all so um, it's still very much um, it, it, at the stage where that there's nothing uh, okay okay so one final thing on. at the ISMAP Europe conference in January taking place in London um, there is uh, a hackathon session which is all focused around uh, GPP and what people want to see in the next uh, iteration. So uh, oh, okay. is, is very involved in that. So I just want so to- So there is, there's a well, move in that direction. Is. Yeah, there's, there's a, a move in that direction. Yeah. And we should just clarify for people who are watching this video in 2025, what you just mentioned there is the European meeting, uh, which will be in London in January 2025. So some people might be watching this afterwards. OK, OK, look, I, I know I, I I was putting you on the spot there, but I think it's you know, in the context of what we're talking about, it's really quite important to to at least get some of that context. Um, I don't know, who, Hamish, um, you've usually got something to say about this sort of stuff. I mean, I'm not asking you to talk about um, the stuff that you can't talk about. What I'm interested in, just as a general point, um, maybe just quickly, do you see patient authors getting more involved is it just a trend that you think is happening can we all would we all just agree that that's a trend that's happening yeah absolutely i mean a few years ago we didn't have any and now we have some so i think that's, that's definitely the case um, okay and then and, and claire and mitty are both nodding their heads as well so oh, definitely claire, you want to say different... something there, well, just I think across all different article types as well, I think maybe initially we started seeing some in some original research papers and now it's much more wide. You can you see them in, in all the different article types that we publish. I'm sure it's the same for, for the other publishers too. So it's def definitely getting more common. Okay, okay, right, guys, we're running out of time, um, inevitably. Um, and I wanted to at least cover off the readership side and the, the PLS aspect um, and the sort of the whole thing about, uh, well, less PLS, but there's lots of enhancements to publications, much of which are designed to increase access to content by all sorts of people, including patients. That was a slightly convoluted sense, but I think I got I think I got there in the end. Um, and we've run entire webinars on this with you, know, with you guys, apart from anything else. Um, if anybody's watching this and wanting to know more about PLS, um, you, you can start in worse places than Network Pharma TV and look at some of our webinars about it. But in the last, it is only three or four minutes. Can we just touch on PLS in the context of for patients? That in itself is a difficult one because PLS is not necessarily for patients, but any conversation about PLS gets tangled up in that because some people see PLS as for patients and some people very much don't. Claire, I'm going to let you lead the way on that one. You know why, so no words in your mouth. You go with it. Yeah, so, I mean, with our plain language summary articles, our summary research articles, um, and with our PLS abstracts, our primary audience is still healthcare professionals because that's that's our um you know our, our audience of our journals that's what all of our content is aimed at but because we're writing in a jargon free way then then it is obviously of interest to patients particularly educated patients or those who are going out to research their own conditions um we've seen it it's very tricky to write jargon free i mean we've seen we've seen instances where sentences have been oversimplified to the point that they're not actually technically or scientifically correct anymore so it's quite a difficult thing to do uh which is why we don't put a kind of reading age on it and we, we you know we go over the, all of this with a fine tooth comb still to to look at each sentence and to make sure it still retains its meaning so that's one reason and then obviously coming back to compliance which i know was covered in in previous sessions of the compliance and the legal issues around if it's pharma sponsored research of them you know being seen as promoting directly to patients as well so you know the content's open access patients can come across it but we we are targeting um at healthcare you know non-specialist healthcare professionals or even specialists who are time poor and just want to get a quick quick summary of something in it in an easy to read way but also available for patients who who want to come across it and find it if okay i think the interesting one of the interesting aspects of pls as i say if you look back over the last few years is how it's always been talked about and and in the early days it was talked about but nothing was really happening and we've gradually got to the stage where things are happening but there are there are lots of issues in there and i do i do 
I do think one of the big problems is people need to talk about the same thing when they're talking about this. Um, and, and and the patient versus generalist versus is, is, is always an issue of confusion. Laura, you've got, and particularly in your previous life, I guess, I mean, you you led the way you were you were an important part of developing um the pls sort of concept what, what's your view on this at the moment yeah well, I, I, and i'm talking PLS, specifically about uh, the patient PLS, versus please. non-patient yeah yeah i mean i think i, I specifically in my role now but with the health economics journal it, it's interesting as well because we find a lot of uptake for the pls um but it's not necessarily patient i mean i think patients can read them and do read them but with us it's more around sort of um maybe health policy makers or right. or you know hcps and things that are wanting to to understand these more technical kind of health economic studies um in uh, more of a, a plain uh, format um for me personally plain language summaries are there for whoever it is that wants to find and read them um and i don't it's it's dif- you can't really i don't think you can define who it's for when you're writing it who it's for is who finds it and who finds it useful so I the think problem, the I'm... problem with that and I know if we're not careful we'll just get into a in, into a lively debate about this but the problem is always the same problem right um if you're writing your article in your specialist journal for specialists you've got a fairly clear idea of who's reading it if you then go we need a PLS but it can be for anybody then uh, where do you pitch it? You know, that's an enormous, really wide spectrum of 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 of, of readership ability, academic ability, and all the rest of it. And patients who can be very expert or not, or generalists who can be very expert or not, and so on. And I've, you know, we we've had plenty of discussions. We we you read advice on PLS, which talks about writing them for a reading age of you know twelve or something. You know, the whole conversation gets so confused around that basic problem you know i and you want a pls that's written for me and you don't answer hamish i'm because we're going to run out of time hamish one one can paint a picture that you know ai is going to magically solve all this problem that you'll publish your original article i peter llewellyn will come in and go i want a plain language summary in my language for me at a push of a button how close to reality is that? I don't think we're we're quite there yet. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately we still need some level of human verification. Um, I think and that's that's ultimately the, the point that we'll be there for a while at least. Um, but, you know, at, at Sage, we are experimenting with a hybrid solution. So AI generated PLS with human verification, uh, which we'll be able to offer authors. Initially, we're doing a trial where we offer some authors uh, these for free. Uh, but the idea is that these will become sort of a very, very sort of affordable service perhaps in the future. I think, you know, in the future, you know, being speculative, it's possible that, you know, when people are uploading manuscripts, we we could have a box or something like that where you press a button and it generates a PLS for you. Um, but that's me sort of blue sky thinking, you know, thinking about where that could be in the future. That's not something that we've necessarily planned, but I think that could definitely be the future. Okay, I, I see it absolutely as the future. Um, and for what it's worth, if people are interested in this, we had a very entertaining conversation not so long ago on one of these webinars. You can find it in Network Pharma TV about the role of AI. Um, Mitty, I'm going to finish. You've got 30 seconds. We're slightly over, so I am going to finish with Mitty. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of back to you with your patient advocate hat on, I suppose. Just with that hat on, can you say a few words about the direction we're going in, how accessible content is to patients and the advocates and how hopefully positive you are about the future direction we're going in. I'm sorry you've only got 30 seconds, Mitty. I am very positive, especially from the publisher perspective as a patient advocate. I think it's really promising to see that publishers are kind of exploring the ways that they can collaborate. And as a patient advocate, the charity that I work with, they're always asking me questions about what publishers are doing, what the publishing options are. And that's something that wasn't in the conversation two or three years ago with them. So I think it's a really positive space and it's really great to see more and more patient advocates getting involved in publications as well, because that can only mean that we try and find more solutions to any problems. Excellent. OK, look, I'm, I'm so frustrated that we're not now hitting the bar and just having having a chat about things. Um <laughs> So um, thank you to the audience for sticking with us. To you guys, thank you so much. And a very, very clear message 
um, that, that you're all very happy to hear from people via LinkedIn is an easy way. But an, an important message, which we always say with these Meet the Publisher sessions is, I'm not being funny, but you are the right people to talk to. And there are lots of people in and around Medcoms are going, you know, who do I talk to about publishing a paper with that? Well, actually, you guys are the right people. So please, everyone make contact with them. Um, hugely, th thank you hugely. I feel that was great fun, but we could have spent a lot longer talking about all sorts of things. And I can feel myself all excited about the stuff we haven't talked about. So we'll keep the discussion going. Um, anybody um, can go look at Network Pharma TV and see lots more of this sort of content. Um, but um, thank you very much for today. I'm going to ask you all to give us a little wave and say goodbye and wish everybody a good day. Take care. Bye.